so um, my name's Claudia Stover. I think I've met each and every one of you, and some of you I've known for years. Um, our, one of the people in our group is Pooja uh, Parsons. She is the wife of Udgar Parsons. She's been the CEO at Growing Spaces, so it's um, it's nice to have her with. She's been around Growing Domes her whole life, and now she's able to really enjoy her own personal one as they retired and sold the company. <clears throat> so starting off, let's just talk a little bit about um, uh, Growing Domes. And I myself have had a, a dome for, um, I've had two domes, I grow in two domes. Uh, I've got my first one 14 years ago and they're wonderful growing rooms. There's no question about that. Um, one of the most important things that the Growing Dome offers is the this big water tank, which acts as a battery um, for our uh, growing rooms. And so what we want to appreciate and understand thoroughly is why do we have all this water and is it possible to have the Growing Dome without water? Well, the, the real true answer is no. It doesn't matter if you live in cold or if you live in warm areas, you need the water tank to stabilize the temperature. And the way we're going to demonstrate that is by this picture that you're looking at right now, which is a picture of, this is the Arkansas River. You all have your own rivers in the dead of winter. When we go down past a river, we see the steam rising off of the top of it. And um, that is because the water is actually warmer than the air in the dead of winter. Now the very opposite happens in the summertime. Uh, this time of year, uh, today it was very toasty and got close to 90 degrees. And if we went down to the Arkansas River now, it would be somewhere between 65 and 70 degrees. So water is allows a cooling effect in the summer and a warming effect in the winter time. So we bring that same thing into the growing dome and that's why our growing rooms work year round. When you think about it, most greenhouses are useless in the wintertime and in the summertime. So the growing dome makes it so that that tank convex into the dome and it stabilizes the temperature to where we can use our domes year round. For right off the bat, we're gonna talk about different types of uh, ways we can use our water tank. And when a person walks into the dome, especially a new person, usually they're so attracted by the sound of the water in the tank that their eye turns immediately to the water tank. And so often people don't know quite what to do with their water tanks, how to, how to use them, not just as a functional unit, but as a beautiful uh, portion of their, of their um, dome. So I'm gonna just show you a couple of examples of other things that people have done. As you can see, this particular person chose to take, um, they live on a farm. They took one of the old farm pumps and brought it in and ran the water through the pump and down over rocks. It makes it a very musical sound. So we, don't ha we can be content with the waterfall that we got with our growing dome. Um, but you don't have to. You can change it up and, and add your own creativity. Here's another example of a waterfall that is, um, this was an old uh, family bowl and she decided to drill a hole through it and make it part of her waterfall. It's also interesting, you might notice that she has um, this um, wire netting on the bottom of her um, cross beam, and that's so that her, she's able to keep her water hyacinths and water lettuces up front, um, and yet the fish can swim through. I just wanted you to see that. It's kind of interesting. Another great waterfall, very easy to do, is uh, a waterfall that is made from a piece of flagstone. Needs to be pretty good size, um, and you can take all your favorite rocks, and we most of us have a lot of favorite rocks uh, here in Colorado. It's nice to showcase them and they always look more beautiful when they're wet anyway. Here's another waterfall. This one is made, looks like a conch, but it's actually just a piece of clay. It's made uh, at one of these walk-in, pay-by-the-hour pottery places. 
and she went in uh, with the purpose of making a waterfall um, for her dome and isn't that beautiful so lovely and here's another one I wanted you to see um, a, a really interesting uh, example it's a tin bowl uh, you can see they've drilled holes in the sides of the bowl and then to um, keep that water from spattering over the uh, cross beam you can see that they've added a, a, a wire I mean a, a metal guard and that's really nice looking but here I want you to notice uh, what goes into that particular tin bowl. It's a faucet with an old faucet going in through rock and then it fills, the water fills in the rock and then the rock fills the bowl and out it comes. Very pretty. Another beautiful uh, example, this is done by an artist that has a growing dome and he took uh, metal and arched it around so it's actually pumping water around the metal and then it flows down through these threading at the very top and runs threading a little water droplets down into the dome. The only thing I don't recommend about this particular setup is that it, it does use copper. Copper is really not compatible with fish. So I would recommend using a different kind. In fact, that's why he ended up uh, changing his waterfall. But it is interesting before you leave this slide, I want you to see that behind his waterfall, um, he has willows that he's just lopped off from the river and brought in. And willows have uh, a quality where they have a root stimulant. So he tacked them to the back of his cross beam just to add a root stimulator to his water. Here's another uh, waterfall idea. It was uh, some family statuary that actually had some real endearing qualities with their own family, her raising her kids. And so she brought that into the dome to be uh, part of their waterfall. And all of these are just attached to the solar waterfall that you got with the dome. So it's the solar panel and the pump. This one I just have had to include because it has a good and a bad story. The good part is it's a beautiful, beautiful waterfall. Um, this particular uh, dome customer had this specially built for his dome. This is a 26 foot dome, so um, a, a good size tank. Um, this, is, this particular waterfall weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds. So in order to support it, he had to bring have a footer made to hold up this waterfall. So how do you do that with our tank liners and all? Well, what he had to do is he had to first line the tank, then he had the footer put in with, and it had feet that would protect um, on the bottom of the floor of the dome so the feet of the footer wouldn't pierce the, the liner. Um, but then he got this crazy idea to in his backyard, he brought in some concrete blocks because he decided he wanted to have extra plants floating around um, supporting some, some uh, submerged plants in his pond. Well, the bad news is that he knocked one of the concrete blocks over. The concrete block pierced the lining. Now he's got a hole in the lining, which for you or me, if that happened, we changed the liner, but he's got this footer and this very, very heavy waterfall on top of it. So it created quite a problem. In fact, uh, Pooja probably remembers because this, um, her husband had to go down and help dry out the tank liner and patch it. And they just hoped for the best. So the reason I put this in is think out what you're gonna do with your waterfall and um, always consider that you might have to have to correct matters at some point. The next picture is just to show you the ability to use your water tank as a propagation station. And um, if you look in the back of this tank, the second half of it has lattice going across the back here. And so in the winter time or early spring when she's getting new starts going or all year round, she can put start plant starts back there and anything over the water tank is thermally stable. So it's, you can grow over the water tank um, 
more readily any time of the year because it's not going to get too hot, not going to get too cold. So very nice place for propagation. So that's something to consider as well. Um, also, keep in mind that we want to keep our water tanks full. So two to three inches below the cross beam is really where we want to keep our water year round. The next segment is um, actually a reference to the four classes of water plants. And if you had a chance, we have a section of um, under the printout to the PDF that I sent, it's called basic water plant groupings. And <clears throat> the pages two and three of the notes actually refer to um, the next section we'll talk about. So this is the first of those groupings. It's an area, a group of plants called oxygenators. And oxygenators are just what they say. They provide oxygen into the water. So they are actually submerged far under the water surface. And in this case, um, we're looking at a nacris. There's parrot feather there. There's some horntail. Um, there's some Sagittaria. These are all oxygenators. Now, how do we use them and keep them underneath the water tank? Well, you can get a, a mesh bag. There's several different kinds that are out there. And black is always nice because nobody can see it as it drops into the water tank. But you can even use a, like an onion bag if you uh, still can find those that are made out of uh, cloth um, or some sort of mesh. And drop a stone into the bottom of it right down in the very bottom of that bag and then fill it up with oxygenators and drop it into the tank so that it hangs into the lower half of the water tank and then it will help provide oxygen into that lower area. Um, does it provide enough, enough oxygen uh, for our lower two feet? Probably not, but it does um, give off oxygen and the fish do love it. It's kind of a little uh, treat of a fish uh, feeding station for the fish. So that's also kind of fun for them. We'll talk a little bit more about providing oxygen into the lower part of the tank. It is an option if you don't have a really big water tank, it's not a bad choice, um, but it doesn't provide uh, enough oxygen for a, a large tank for sure in the lower part. The second grouping is called our submerged plants. And <clears throat> these plants are beautiful. They're water lilies and water lotuses. And you'll see a listing of them there. Um, I will say this, um, usually when we see water lilies, this picture was taken at Denver Botanical Gardens, they're in shallow ponds. And so um, I've noticed over the years that water lilies only grow, they usually only flower in our domes the first year that they're purchased if you are a person that has an elliptical dome, which means if you have a 15 and 18 a 22 or 26, you've got an elliptical tank. If you have a 33 or a 42 foot dome, the big domes, they have round tanks, you might be able to get a bloomer. And here's the reason why we don't have those uh, beautiful blooms after the first year. Uh, submerged plants come from nurseries where they um, have been sitting in shallow ponds. They store that energy into the bulb at that nursery or in that shallow pond, and then you buy it, that stored energy gives that beautiful flower the first year. And then usually after that, all you get is um, the fronds, which are also pretty. You've got beautiful leaves, but no flowers. And I, my thinking is the reason is because you can't get enough sunlight over the rim of the tank and down into that elliptical shape, um, you can't get enough sunlight down into that submerged plant because it's sitting 12 to 18 inches below the water surface. So my thinking on that is this is a ex very expensive plant, um, not the best choice unless you have a round tank and then you can put it on the far wall, uh, far north wall in the Northern hemisphere. Um, and you, you can have a chance of getting enough sunlight down into the root base. The next group of plants 
is one that lots of you are familiar with. These are water hyacinths. They're floaters is, is the grouping. And uh, in the world of floaters, there's water hyacinths and water lettuce. There's uh, parrot feather, which shows up in almost every category. Um, there's um, um, several other ones, some that are even hardy in the winter time. Um, for example, frog bit, which I have a picture of. But here's the thing, this picture is taken in a 42 foot dome. It's beautiful, isn't it? But you see they have really nothing but water hyacinths in here. And they're very crowded in here. They're so happily growing together and making babies that they're basically um, stressed a little bit. And so they produce these stunning looking flowers. And we all love the way this looks. So, um, and, and I'll, I'm gonna show you how you can stress these plants so that you can get that kind of production. Before I do though, I want you to look at, this is frog bit, which is hardy and will actually live through our winters, whereas the water hyacinth and the water lettuce are um, tropical. So we don't expect them to live year after year. They usually don't unless they're in a large dome with um, a lot of glazing because those water temperatures stay a little bit warmer. Um, but frog bit does have a lung on the bottom of each of these round uh, circles and, and they will live through the winter. They are a little bit um, heavy on the maintenance level because you're constantly removing little round pieces, but they're kind of fun. I've certainly grown all of these. So I'm speaking from experience. I do like the look of them and I'm just amazed how they have their little lungs. Uh, this is parrot feather. That also can be um, a float in the floater category as well. So how can we stress those water hyacinths to bloom? If you have any kind of a round circle, this is a quite a large ring. It's about two feet across. Um, you can put it, tie it underneath your waterfall. Uh, water hyacinths and water lettuce love to be uh, pounded on by water. Uh, you can do what I did here. This is under my waterfall. I have parrot feather in here that's propagating. And that kind of can keep my other islands out of the way of the waterfall as well. Um, sometimes people use a, a product called a backer rod and they'll just, or a hula hoop, and they just make a circle so that they can um, encase those floaters so that they will be stressed and then therefore they bloom for you. So that's kind of fun. The fourth group is our big group and it's a has a whole page of printout, page number three, marginal and bog plants. And bog plants, of course, as, it, as the name says, grow in a boggy area or along the margins of a pond. So marginal or bog plants is what they're called. <clears throat> so lots of plants fall into this category. And these are the ones that really are wonderful in our islands. So this is a picture of one of my dome tanks. And of course it's about 100% full, but that raises the point, how full do we want our water surface coverage? We actually want to try to get 60 to 70% coverage at least on our tank. And why is that? We're gonna talk about this extensively, but um, you, we need to understand that we're always trying to combat the growth of algae. And algae grows from two things. It grows from sunlight and it grows from nutrients in the water. So if we have fish or plant nutrients or minerals from the water um, and you combine it with, especially in the winter time with the heavy sun that hits our, our surfaces, you're gonna have some algae. Everybody gets some algae. We just need to learn how to control it. So the more shade we can put on our tank, the happier um, or the less happy the algae is. So it doesn't grow as much and the happier we are in the process. These are some examples of marginals. There's so many beautiful ones. It was hard to pick out just a couple. But um, this is uh, an example of Gamecock iris. Uh, it gets to be quite a, a big plant and I think it's quite beautiful. You can see just produced 
uh, so many beautiful flowers this year. This is just a snippet of them. And then another one that just happens to bloom at the very same time as the gamecock is this particular one. It's called monkey flower. It has a little uh, red polka dots on the inside. Um, it's actually really beautiful. But I especially love it because it is such a nice complement to the purple of the black gamecock. Um, they're across the color wheel and they bloom at the same time. Very beautiful. Marginals, these are more pictures of marginals. You'll see cannas and uh, cardinal lobelia. There's monkey flower there. There's um, uh, lysimachia. There's all kinds, there's some uh, water celery, all kinds of plants, lots of beautiful plants. So um, don't always keep in mind your water island itself is really um, valuable. So even if you decide that you don't want anything in your water island, you wanna just clean it out, don't throw it away because all the, um, the bulk of the value is in your, this extruded foam basket. So, but it does, uh, it is one thing we'll talk about when we get to the maintenance section of this discussion is that we want to make sure that we are fertilizing our islands and that we are also um, splitting them every year or two because these plants can get quite large and you don't want them to burst out of the island. Um, so we do it before it becomes impossible. Um, so just talking about fertilization quickly, um, I just want to um, remind everybody that with your water islands, you always get, those are pond tabs plus um, that go in the, came in the little bag. And um, please remember that from February through the month of October, preferably every two months, you should be giving them some fertilization. That's their food. And we give them the months of November, December, and January to rest. And then February comes around and we fertilize them again. Um, we'll talk about cutting them back in the winter time, but really try hard to make a schedule so you don't forget to fertilize. What do we do if we see these marginal plants um, actually browning up? And this happens, people often think that when they see them browning up, that they're gonna go back to green again. Well, guess what? They're not. And the, you're really creating um, a disaster in your pond. The quality of your water is gonna go down. This browning is uh, dead tissue. It's not gonna go back. So the best thing you can do, for example, with this stem right here is track it all the way back down to the bottom and cut it off and you'll find new ones coming up all the time. So please take the time to do that. Um, cut back anything that is brown. We call that the three Ds. Brown equals one of those three Ds, dead, damaged, or diseased. So uh, we try to get rid of all the brown and keep our water quality at its best. Here's another example. This is a water hyacinth, looking at it from the bottom side. And you'll notice that there's some browning here on this water hyacinth. All you have to do is gently hold that water hyacinth and pull down ever so gently when you see something brown and you can just pull off that segment. That's gonna help the plant grow. Um, in this particular picture, we're showing off the root system. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, these black roots are, are uh, wonderful for the fish to swim through. They like that, but the actual viable roots that are the most critical are these white ones. So if you decide that you want to get rid of some of these massive roots here, you can gently pull on the very bottom of this and it'll just pull out. Very easy to do, kind of like removing a, a dust bunny or something, just pulls out very gently. Here's a picture of a hyacinth in the winter time. And uh, I do, get, I get a lot of uh, people call me and ask, what's wrong with my hyacinth? Well, again, just remember they are tropical. They really don't want to get below 55 degrees. It's, they're not, it's not a good reason to have, to try to heat your water. Um, they're inexpensive plants. 
Um, we get a lot of bang for our buck out of a hyacinth, but because they'll give us eight, nine, ten months of of uh, pond coverage. But at this point, the best thing you can do is pull out the nets and net them out of there. Uh, while we're looking at this picture, I want you to notice the barley bale in the back. And barley is one of those items that um, is actually good for the water quality, but barley bales and barley planters, and I've tried them all, so I'm speaking from experience, they are kind of a pain in the neck because they're messy and they, they do get out of that netting and pretty soon they're all over your tank and you're trying to net out pieces of barley. So um, most of us in the world of um, the dome owners, most of us are 50 and over. And so we're trying to lessen our load of maintenance. And so I instead buy barley extract. It's already extracted and believe me, I. I went through my years of using barley bales and barley balls and barley everything, but barley extract, they've done the work for me. It's so good for the pond water. I even use this to clean the outside of my islands and then put them back in. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this character uh, a little bit later. It's more bacteria. So with our water um, islands or any marginal or bog plants, um, we, um, we want to be slap happy with pruning. Sometimes people are afraid to prune things off, but every plant, it's the water plants are a lot like our soil plants. They want to be pruned and they grow better if we prune them. So this happens to be a picture of a snippet of watercress that I snipped off just a green end, put it in a glass of water, and this is less than two, 48 hours later, so less than two days, it has already produced all of this root, these root hairs. So we want to take advantage of what our plants are trying to do. They want, as they grow, they will give you more um, plant life. So for example, if you have water celery or monkey flower, or um, really hutinia, chameleon, hutinia double, watercress, uh, almost all the plants want to make more plants. That's what plants do. They're always trying to make more, more babies. So what can we do to make that as easy a process as possible? Well, this little character, the black structure on the right-hand side, I call it a hat for, because to me, it looks like a top hat. So I'm gonna to refer to it as a hat. And this is a, uh, an item that you can go to the hydroponics store and buy for about $6. And then I went to Walmart or uh, Hobby Lobby and picked up a, a cheap floral ring. These are not the same as the rings that are inside of our islands. These are very lightweight, cheap rings, but they just happen to fit perfectly over the hat. And when you turn it upside down, it can hold, this is a picture of a hat with uh, the ring underneath it. It can hold our cuttings. So these are cuttings of water celery. And um, I took this picture this afternoon actually, and uh, my fish were so excited that I came out to feed them <laughs> that they were, I, think I got a good picture of them too. So, uh, but this is just water celery and um, it's sitting in a hat. And so what you do is you are pruning your plants, you just snip, snip, snip and throw it into the hat. And then you're not only getting more plants because they will soon make more roots and you've got more plant life, but you also, even with this very inexpensive $10 total hat structure, you've got more coverage on your pond surface. So I keep about four of these hats going in every dome and they have all different things in them. Uh, you don't really wanna put a plant in them because they're not gonna hold the plant, the soil and the root base, but they're perfect for cuttings. They will hold peppermint I, and, and different mints all by themselves because, but you can't put the soil in there very well. <laughs> okay, so another um, uh, item that is, Part of the floater um, grouping of plants 
is this one called a, a Zola. And a Zola, if you look closely, it's actually a fern. And it's a tiny, tiny little fern, turns kind of reddish in the winter. Um, it's a little bit pretty. Um, I'm not crazy about it because it does, is so invasive that it has this tendency to climb up the sides of the water plants, the rushes or, or whatever grasses you have or whatever kind of plants, it climbs onto our islands and it chokes plants. So um, it is a floater that you can use. It makes a very inexpensive coverage to your pond. But if you already have um, marginals and bog plants, I would steer clear of this particular item along with duckweed. And even though um, sometimes people like this plant, so they'll have some to give to their chickens. Um, but in general, um, it's pretty hard for fish to keep up with any of the eating because it is so rapidly reproducing. Here's an example of a picture I took of an island that was being attacked by Azola. And you can see why I am not crazy about Azola because this island was beautiful and it is in dire straits now. So, and even its next door neighbor island is getting invaded. You can see how that Azola climbs up the sides and it's choking out the plant. So be on the lookout for Azola and duckweed. Uh, a little bit often comes automatically with your water plants. Um, it, we try very hard for it not to get to you, but a lot of times you'll have some and that's fine. You can allow your fish to eat that or you can um, uh, net it out, but just be watchful because it can get the best of your water tank quickly. If you choose to have it um, and it's really something you wanna have and you wanna just make your whole tank um, to have these two floaters, Azola or duckweed, then do what um, Udgar did here. He built, he took back a rod and he, um, he uh, covered it with landscape fabric and sewed it up. But truthfully, it does sneak out over the sides. So the great thing about this particular situation is there's no islands in this tank. So it's a decision you have to make. Um, there's my little four fish. And that is the introduction to the, our next section on fish. So in my 22 foot dome, I have uh, capacity for um, a certain number of fish and usually people overdo it and buy too many fish. So we're gonna talk about quantity. <clears throat> I'm back to our um, notes. And you'll notice there that I actually type this in because it so often uh, gets away from people. They buy too many fish. And so you'll notice there that if you have goldfish, you qualify. Well, if you have goldfish, you need 100 gallons of water per fish to support their growing to six to eight inches at a halfway mature size in our tanks. If you want to get koi, then you need 200 gallons of water per fish. So you need to really think about it because if you have a thousand gallons of water, which is approximately what you have in a 22 foot dome, you qualify for five koi or 10 goldfish. And so often we see an overabundance of fish uh, show up in people's tanks because they buy them when they're really tiny and then um, those fish grow up and they are really really create a lot of a mess in the tank. So um, before we go on to some of those fishy issues, uh, let's talk really quickly about um, how we're going to feed our fish. So um, I'm not advertising for this company, but I do, this is a, a good, um, these are good quality fish foods. Um, fish do not need to eat as often as people think. And if you go to a regular fish store, they're going to tell you you need to feed them twice a day. And um, they usually want you to also have an automatic feeder. I don't like automatic feeders because they put down too much food, even if they're on their lowest setting. 
So how we, how much are we going to feed? Well, the, the rule of thumb is you only feed what they can eat every in three to five minutes and you only feed every two to four days. At least that's the, the rule of thumb I've always used and read about. And it seems to keep things at bay because you feed too much, you end up getting a lot of um, nutrients in the water from the fish excrement. It mucks up your tank. The fish don't eat everything. And it is really creating a lot of, of work for you. Plus it's expensive. So let's just talk real quickly about these particular items. And first of all, we'll start with the thermometers on the bottom. So um, the one thermometer, the black one, actually has a gauge on it that shows some temperatures at which you change the way you feed. So we that's really important to us. So if you don't have a thermometer, you need one. Now that black one is a floater. Um, I really like reading uh, temperature lower, so you can either take a floating thermometer and put a weight on it and let it hang at least two feet into the dome uh, tank. Or this other one is a, is a swimming pool thermometer. It's weighted and it hangs low. So um, both are good. I use both. And so I read at the top of the surface as well as uh, down toward the bottom. But here's the thing. Fish cannot go into the wintertime with food in their belly. And I just had somebody call me um, about a month ago and said that they're, they'd lost their fish. And what happened? Well, they never stopped feeding. So we need to really think about this because the fish act like they're dying if they're not eating and they're very friendly. Um, usually we, we go with um, koi or, or uh, goldfish, but you can have other fish too. Uh, some people have had brookies. Tilapia in general is not a good fish to choose because they wanna be really warm. So in the Rockies here, that's not really a good choice. And lots of them have died. And that's, uh, that's a aquaponics problem, really. You, you're really kind of married to uh, measuring your pH and everything. But anyway, so back to our, when, our temperature issue. So when my water uh, gauge reads 60 degrees or warmer in my water tanks, then I feed a staple food. It's a high protein, good food for fish. Uh, there's many on the market. This is just an example. But when my temperature drops below 60, which would be in the spring and the fall, you're gonna have temperatures below 60. From 60 to 55, I move into this spring and fall food. And then from 55 to 50, I only give a half quantity of what I gave the five degrees before. So I'm basically weaning them off of food and when it hits 50 degrees, I no longer feed them. Now they'll come up to the surface and tell you they're hungry, um, but you can't let them go into the winter with food in their belly and they're fine. And you'll notice as it gets colder and colder, they move slower and slower, and then they go into a semi hibernation and you may not see them for a couple of months. And that's normal. They always show back up again. I'm amazed, but uh, please learn to feed them correctly. Now, if you don't have spring and fall food and you feel like you need it, here's another alternative, Cheerios. It's lower in protein and it is an okay option if you uh, aren't too worried about what else is in the Cheerios. Um, also, um, this little feeding station is, is just a reminder to mention that if you do have an automatic feeder, consider not using it. If they just always put down too much food. So, um, and I've, we've gone away and um, the fish are fine. The fish do fine. So don't overthink it. Um, but if you do have a fish feeder automatic and you wanna keep it just for when you go away, that's one thing you can consider. What's wrong with this picture? She's got a 22 foot dome, that's a thousand gallons. She's got about 20 fish please don't do this. It's very hard to get fish out. And um, it's, uh, uh, you can set traps, you can do the netting, but really one wop with a net, 
um, whatever you got in your net is pretty much all you're going to get. And they're going to hate you and not trust you for another, for weeks, for weeks. It takes a long time to earn their trust back. So here's some of the tools that I use. <clears throat> You'll notice that a lot of my tools have these little um, floaty things that you use at the swimming pool. I just cut a snippet off. And that keeps my nets, all those little green foamy things, keep my nets. If I drop them, they're going to be right there on the surface for me. So that's a really good tip. Uh, you'll notice I use a lot of different brushes, um, even toothbrush. Um, but the most important brush of all is really that toilet brush. It's dedicated just to the dome. All these are dedicated just to the dome. Um, but they can help us keep um, our muck and um, debris, detritus at bay. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about how that toilet brush really works to an advantage for us in just a little bit. <coughs> Here's a picture you don't wanna see, but it does happen. This is muck and muck is um, a product of those nutrients in the water and uh, algae buildup and so what we want to do is have a, a control, and that's where use of bacteria comes in handy. So if we have a, a bacterial product that we're adding, or we have a way to uh, reproduce bacteria in our tank naturally, then we're going to keep this muck issue at bay. But those scrubbers that you saw, some of them were... Um, uh, bathroom scrubbers that you would use for grout, things like that. They really do a great job of scrubbing down our um, rocks, any kind of uh, sidewalls. You can notice even the cross beam in this particular dome uh, needs to be uh, scrubbed down as well. Here's a, a horrible picture, but such a good example. Um, we, Rick and I, often were asked to help people um, clean out their dome tanks. And so it's a pretty gross job, but um, we, we did it. <laughs> and so this particular dome is about three years old at the time. And it has, this is string algae. It's the worst of the algaes. Um, very hard to, to get rid of string algae. It's not easily handled by any kind of UV lights or um, bacterial stations. You always have some. So what we wanna do is not have much. Now, why does this guy have this level of string algae and all this um, buildup on his cross beam? Well, they couldn't resist um, accepting fish donations from friends and they were beautiful fish, but they had 100 fish, lots of them quite large in this tank. So it was a free for all underwater. There was just fish everywhere, but that's a lot of fish food and a lot of fish excrement and a lot of algae being produced. It was a wreck. So in this particular uh, dome, we did after spending a day scrubbing it down, we did end up uh, putting in a filtration system into this dome because they didn't want to get rid of the fish. Uh, I mean, they didn't know how to get rid of the fish. And frankly, um, uh, a lot of these traps, you know, they, they, they're not going to bring fish out at the level you need. And so we did ask a friend who was uh, a fishing expert. Uh, he was actually a guide and um, a wildlife person that gave us some advice. And he said, you know, honestly, for that situation, about the only thing you can really do is uh, have overnight a fresh perch, so have it flown in, a fresh perch alive, and drop it into the tank, and then fish him out another day or two later, and you'll have a lot less fish. So that was a horrible message for that dome owner, and they were just devastated, but the bottom line is, last time I was in that dome, they still had at least 100 fish, so they may have taken up the perch idea. Here's another good idea for uh, trying to maintain that uh, having a lot of filth on your cross beam. This is just, um, this is in one of my domes and this is just a shelf liner 
that I ordered um, online and it has a ribbing in it. It makes it so that it actually kind of falls over the sides and it keeps my cross beam clean, which for me is pretty important because I'm always dragging islands back and forth. So, um, and I'm kind of a, you know, messy. So I like that because I can just wipe it off. So it's a nice idea. Another good way for us to develop bacteria in our domes is <clears throat> by, excuse me, by building a biofilter. And this biofilter is really just a piece of large pottery. Um, we put a pump that goes and tubing that goes through the bottom hole of the piece of pottery. And then these black balls are called bio balls. They have a lot of surface area and bacteria grow on them. And then we put um, a piece of filter media over the top to hold the bio balls in place. And then hyacinths over the top of that. Hyacinths love water running through their roots. So this was a great little nursery area for new hyacinths. Um, I have um, these bio filters in both of my domes and I, they've always been great. That was my beginning of uh, trying to understand the world of bacteria and keeping my algae at bay. This is another thing you can do with bio balls. Uh, you can put it in a, a net and hang it again. These nets are available from any pond supplier and hang it off of the back of your cross beam. If your net is black, it's invisible once it goes into the tank. So now our water islands, uh, are so beautiful, and but they need to be maintained. So what are we gonna do to try to keep them, them maintained? So often people just hate cutting back their water islands. And I'm begging you that to put December on your calendar, that sometime during the month of December, you cut your water, your marginal plants in your water islands, cut them back. They really want that. It's good for them, and this is a quiet time for them over the winter. So you cut them back about two to four inches high. So it's quite a bit below the cross beam, cross beam here. They're cut way back. Now there is one exception uh, to that, and that's this plant, the red canna or green canna. Um, the canna as well, uh, here's a, I want you to see this picture. Where it's it's actually coming out here on the stem, that's the next leaf area. So if you cut it down here at two to four inches, you're gonna cut off any prospective growth on that plant. And so that would be the end of that plant. So we wanna cut it high. So this particular plant, I usually cut six to eight inches high. Another plant that I cut six to eight inches high, and this is the only other one, is the taro. <clears throat> so the taro plant is um, this tall plant here rising. It has the same structure on the stem, so you want to cut it high so that it will um, actually have future growth. Now just a, a, a word about the taro plant. Taro plants can be magnets for white flies. I don't know where they come from, but if anybody in the greenhouse is gonna have a white fly on it, it's usually the bottom side of a taro plant. So <clears throat> if I see any kind of uh, white fly infestation, I immediately cut that whole stem off all the way down and I carry it immediately outside. White flies can't live uh, outside the greenhouse. So I take it immediately outside. I don't throw it on the ground and wait till I have 10 of them. I take it immediately outside. I don't want that plant inside with that structure. So if you have taro, and taro is beautiful, and it comes in a purple color as well, but just be on the lookout um, so that you don't have any white fly infestation. This in front of the, um, I want you to see this, this is the, the flower that comes off of that red canna. Isn't that stunning? <clears throat> so these plants are really worth um, worth taking care of. And I, uh, before I leave this slide, I just want you to notice here uh, and then just share this story. One of, um, one of our dome clients 
decided to clean out her water island and set it outside um, to dry in the sun. It was completely emptied. She was just changing it completely out. Her husband picked it up thinking that it was trash, threw it in the trash can. The trash man came within the hour. She walks out of her dome and there's no island out there. And so she was devastated because this is expensive. This is an expensive product here. And you might say the plant life is almost free, but it's very expensive that extruded foam. So don't, don't let it sit outside without somebody knowing that it's just drying in the sun for a good reason. <laughs> Um, I'd like to just touch uh, base with a, a couple of ideas on how can you keep your water tank a little extra warm in the winter. Since we know that it, the water tank is so important to keep our domes warm in the winter, then a little extra warmth is even better. I don't heat, um, I don't really like water heaters. Um, your stock tank heaters really don't uh, trip until the water gets down to 45. So and they cost about a dollar a day to run a stock tank heater. Um, a lot of heat, there is a heater on the market that costs about $350 that's pretty cool, but that's a lot of money. And um, do we really need to do that? I, not in my opinion. I like the, I like seeing what the dome can do. These domes are wonderful, but here's one of the ideas that I did. <clears throat> so I have two domes. I took polycarbonate, you're all used to that. That's the very same material that's on the outside of your dome. And I cut two pieces to go over each of my domes. Now they can't cover the waterfall. The waterfall has to off gas and it needs to run in the dead of winter. So this is a very loose fit, but you can imagine as long as the sunlight can get in there, this is a happy warmer tank. Here's another couple of ideas. Now you see that piece of polycarb there. That's the same 16 mil poly polycarb that you have on the outside of your domes. Um, but here's another good idea right, right up above it. That is called greenhouse bubble wrap. And that, it looks like a little bubble there, but it's actually huge. It's probably the size of a, of a half dollar, each bubble. And they're very sturdy. Uh, you can get these from a greenhouse vendor. Uh, you buy it by the foot. And it's actually, um, you can drape it over your tank for those winter months, December, January, and just drape it over by using a two by four at uh, perpendicular to your cross beam. And so it's a very loose fit. This is not, we're not talking about a saran wrap fit, but very loose. Uh, everything always has to off gas. And that keeps your tank, I believe my tank water stays five to 10 degrees warmer uh, during those months. Um, the other econo version is a clear shower curtain. Again, everything is clear so the sun can still get in. It can still nourish those water islands and any, and the fish are still, well, the fish are gone. They're actually hibernating, but <laughs> the plant life is fine and it's, uh, but it's warmer. So even um, the econo version of a, a heavy duty shower curtain is an option that you can consider. The, the greenhouse bubble wrap is about a third of the cost of the polycarbonate. So, and it's much easier to store those two than it is to store those big pieces of polycarb, but they're all good options. So now it's springtime, which means it's January in the dome. Um, you know, late January is when spring comes and it's time for you to, let's say it's February. You wanna look at those islands of yours again. So you pull them out and there's all this root mass. If you haven't cut it back already um, underneath, uh, you, which you could have done in December uh, when you trimmed the tops, um, you can pull it out now. So the viable roots are those white roots and the other is very easy just to gently pull down and pull out. So feel free to clean up your islands and trim off the, the root system. Here's another good trick that I use. Um, this is just another, it's like a shelf rack. Um, an oven rack works, an old oven rack, um, but you can throw your island up on top and then this way you can fertilize it uh, when you need to do that every two months or you can scrub down the sides or you, know, you can trim roots, whatever. That's a nice, uh, easy thing to store in the greenhouse and it's ready to go. 
And then I wanted you to see this picture. This is a classic picture. Um, at least I think it is. This particular tank that we were cleaning, you can see the mineral deposits on the back side. Um, so we needed to do some scrub down there as well. But look at this is what we were talking about green algae, uh, the string algae in particular. And string algae, when it's wet, it has uh, the texture of like wet, fresh woven wool. Um, it's very hard to net out. Uh, you, everybody thinks they can just scoop it out of there and it slips right out of their fingers. So the answer is that toilet bowl brush and you spin it just like you would spin uh, cotton candy. So um, that is actually all green string algae. It just hooks on and away you go. You can clean the top of the tank that way. So it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing and it's disgusting all at once. Uh, this is my husband. You see he's got the toilet bowl brush in his hand and he is also got a muck back, which is another option. Um, this was in our era of cleaning lots of people's tanks and um, this muck vac actually is like a vacuum that will uh, go along the bottom of your tank. It's just another option. And then it charges, it fills the tank and then charges it out the back end, kind of regurgitates out the back end. And uh, we, of course, prize that water. It's very rich in nutrients. And then we put it out um, onto our garden beds. So uh, when spring comes and your islands come start coming back to life, um, keep in mind that one thing you can always do that is not in the normal marginal world is that you can take impatience, uh, which I actually put on your list of marginal plants. It's not a marginal at all, but it is the only annual flower that I've found that can handle that level of water. So I usually plant impatience high in the island. And you can do that too. So when you go to recharge your plants in the spring, you've cut everything back. It's all coming back to life and you'd like to just give it a spring burst. Go out and buy some impatience or seed, several trays of them, and um, plant them high. But don't plant them with, per with uh, like remove the perlite, uh, any kind of vermiculite or any floating stuff like bark that might be in the soil mix, try to get that out of there because that'll float around your tank. But very pretty. And then I told you that we would talk a little bit about bacteria. Um, and we have with uh, having biofilters and things like that. We're trying to build up our bacterial content in the, in the tank. But here's another, um, I'm not advertising for this group, but I do use this product. I've tried several others. And this is for me, um, been the most successful. I don't want an algicide in my tank. I don't want anything dangerous. This is just bacteria. Um, and it's actually even has bacteria for the winter months. So um, has a regular program. Um, I recommend that people consider buying it at least once. Uh, there's a couple items in there that are that I only use to clean outside the tank, like to clean my rocks off or things like that. Um, and that, because they, they're just a little stronger. But um, if you get on a regular program, it's going to keep things in check. And I think that's what we're after. Uh, this is another good option. People always ask me about filtration. We put a lot of filtration units into people's domes. Uh, they do two things. They keep the water moving. And if you do use any kind of filtration unit, I like a filtration station. This is actually, um, and it's called All Clear. Um, I, again, I got it from the pond guy. But this is called All Clear, and it has a, se a separate pump system that sits on the bottom of the floor of the tank called a solid flow pump. Um, it, does the, uh, it does clean through, so two systems. One is shuttling out clean water. The other one is taking up dirty water. And it, you want to make sure that if you do use any kind of filtration system, you want to make sure that, it, that you're moving your water at least every two hours. That's the minimum. So if you have a thousand gallon tank, 
you don't want any pumping system less than 500 gallons. This is actually a lot more than that, but I love it. I love water movement. I love water movement in the water tank as much as I like air movement in the dome itself. So it's just, uh, it's not expensive. You're not heating. It's not a high cost, but it's a really, uh, it lessens your load. I finally broke down after putting about 20 into other people's domes. We finally broke down and got them for ourselves. And then finally, I want to just add that um, probably the, ease, the simplest Water Gardener's book is Water Gardener's Bible. If you just want an overview, uh, I like this book. I have probably 30 books on water gardening, um, but this is kind of a go-to even for me. It's just easy. And then I also included, um, if you don't have it already, The Greenhouse Gardener's Companion by Shane Smith. It's so readable. Everybody really needs this book. And he's just delightful to read and really knows the, the Mountain West because he was the uh, head uh, botanist at Cheyenne Botanical Gardens for many years. And now he's retired to sunny Paonia. So 